I think I fell in love with photography at high school when I first time saw an image appearing in the dark room, a floating paper in that liquid. I was absolutely captivated by the magic of photography. I think I knew straight away that's what I want to do with my life. I am Hoda Afsha. I was born in Iran in 1983. I now live and work in Melbourne, Australia. I believe in the power of images to change the world by changing the way that we see it. Islamic culture is what I inherited from Iran, from my father, from my family. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. When I hear the sound of Azan, the call for prayers, it just does something to my heart that I can't even describe because this is something that I grew up with. I don't practice religion personally, but the version of Islam that I know is the one that my father introduced me to, and that's the religion of peace and love. This is part of my identity, which I can never ever separate myself from. When 23-year-old Hoda migrated to Australia in 2007, she was surprised by the assumptions people made about her. If you migrate from a non-Western culture into the West, it's a completely different experience. Basically what people think of um, Middle Eastern women is that they're all veiled. And the second problem that we have here is that they think that all veiled women are suppressed and they don't have any sort of sense of autonomy and individuality. When I think about the women that I know over there, the strong women from my mother to my aunties to my friends to all of them, I cannot sort of like fathom the image that people have of us over there. It's just uh, women are sort of um, at the forefront of the society fighting for their rights. Hoda expressed her frustration with the Western stereotype of Muslim women in the way she knew best. She created a series of provocative photographs. I turned the lens of the camera towards myself and my own experience as a migrant who's um, challenged by the stereotypes that existed around me. These are images from my On the Western Eyes series, which I made around 2013 and 14. And they grew out of an anger, basically. I was angry. I made this for the Western audience. I wouldn't have made this if I was still in Iran. Even if someone doesn't know you, they feel like they know you because they see so many reports on, in the media about Muslims, about the Muslim community, about Islam. And as soon as they see you in a veil or as soon as they realise that you're Muslim, if you're a, a, a woman that's not in a veil, um, you immediately uh, judge or they feel like they already know who you are and they know what your story is. So Under Western Eyes is really speaking back to that stereotype and it's really interesting to see people's responses to those works. A lot of people actually feel like Huda is presenting images of Muslim women in the veil who are secretly desiring a so-called Western um, and free lifestyle and that they're actually oppressed but it's actually the opposite. It's satirical and it, it mocks this expectation. My work is intended to create a dialogue for us to talk about these issues, not to slap each other in the face.
I can only speak for myself, not on behalf of the entire country. I'm an individual with my own history and uh, my own narrative that is different from my next door neighbor, my cousin, my friends at the school. I was born after the Islamic Revolution. I was born in 1983, which is like four years after the revolution happened. When you're born in Iran, you basically don't choose whether you want to be Muslim or not. You don't have a choice. You're born as a Muslim if your families were Muslim. I grew up in a middle-class family educated, secular. My mother, she's a really loving, gorgeous mother. She was always reminding us of the fact that the life that we have is a really privileged life in a world that is full of pain and difficulties and struggle and suffering. My father was a lawyer. He always considered himself as a feminist. He was always taking cases of women who couldn't defend themselves and their rights. I remember the first car that he bought me was a big Jeep. And he was like, as a woman, when you drive, you need a big car. He believed in Islam as the religion of peace and something that is different from politicized Islam. He always reminded us of that that Islam is a religion of love that brings people together. It doesn't divide. He was always saying that this is a really private matter. Everyone has their own way of connecting to the world and their God. These are the palace guards in Tehran, where in a few days time, the Shah will be crowned. Before the Islamic revolution in 1979, the Shahs had ruled Persia for over two and a half thousand years. Iran is a huge country with like so many different languages and cultures and dress codes and values. The last Shah, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, ruled Iran for 38 years and modernized the nation with a series of social, economic and political reforms. With its new banks, supermarkets and hotels, Tehran, the capital, has grown dramatically in recent years. Donkeys and camels roamed along here not long ago. My parents grew up during that period, before revolution. In 1979, the Shah's government was overthrown, forcing him into exile. After the Islamic revolution, suddenly everything shifted towards a completely different direction. A new political leader, the deeply religious Ayatollah Khomeini, imposed strict Islamic rule on the country. The books were kind of like mostly focused on an Islamic history rather than the history that existed before. And television was all propaganda. And I remember it was a period that they were defining what the new Iranian identity is. The dress code was no Western item of clothing. People had to wear shirts buttoned up, up to here. Women had to fully cover their heads. Uh, nothing glamorous, nothing shiny. So it was like restructuring that identity from scratch, basically. The first year that I went to school, my parents told me that I should be careful, like what happens inside the house cannot be discussed at the school. If, for example, they ask you whether your family say they praise or not, you, all, you have to say yes, they do, or whether they cover their heads in front of strangers, you have to say yes. So I remember growing up becoming a good liar. You learn how to lie because at the school we were questioned and I was always like, no, no, they do. They do say they prayers. So this struggle with identity st started uh, from very early stages in my life. 
In Iran, what happens inside the house is different from what happens outside in public, at least the environment that I grew up in. There's a kind of a different life happening inside, which is in contrast in most cases to what happens outside. For example, we used to go to parties, like, but the parties were all underground and hidden, and we always had the fear of like getting arrested for it. Like, we were drinking, dancing, young men and women all like hanging out. So that's when I started like picking up my camera, documenting the circle of my friends. And I started realizing that as, as soon as the camera is present in the room, nothing is real anymore. Everyone's performing themselves the way that they want to be captured, not the way that they really are. After graduating from Azad University in Tehran in 2006, Hoda got a job as a news photographer. Yeah, I started working straight away with a news agency, which was like a progressive left-wing news agency. And then after eight months, the newspaper was shut down uh, by the government and I lost my job. My major passion was to become a war photographer, but my mom cried so much that I had to change my mind about it. <laughs> Instead, Hoda made a decision that took her thousands of kilometers from any war zone. She migrated to Australia. I got involved with someone who was living in Australia and I thought I'd come here for six months to see how things go. And then I, here I am nearly 12 years later. There's a time and period that basically your entire world is shattered by the experience of migration. Nobody greets you at the airport and tells you what you're about to step into. You have no idea um, when you arrive somewhere else that what, what challenges you're going to face. And geographical displacement is one thing that is quite common. Everyone goes through that when they migrate, doesn't matter where you're from. And it's always painful, but cultural displacement is something quite significant because it's the loss of identity, language, and your roots all together. Hoda found work as a commercial photographer, but her own photographic projects revealed her new life. It was really difficult to make comments about a history or a place that I had no attachment to. I was new. I didn't felt like I have the authority to talk about Australia, but I could talk about myself. Definitely the experience of migration changes the path of your career and thinking. You can be an insider and outsider at the same time. When you're standing in between, it gives you a lot of new possibilities and new ways of looking. After a certain period, I started seeing things in a different way. Like this idea of being not belonging became some kind of a positive thing for me. Having lived in Perth and Sydney, in 2013, Hoda settled in Melbourne. I've been teaching photography for the past five, six years now. How are you? Good. So they're different, the paper? Is this darker? Yeah. Teaching so is a really interesting paper? job, in fact, especially when you work with a lot of young people who are at that stage in life. No, it's got that sort of like painterly quality, which is something that you want to achieve in your work too. So. You realize how much impact you're leaving on the way that they look at the world and especially using their camera to explore the world that they, they inhabit. At this stop, the doors will open on the right side. 
When I get home from work, my first job starts because I consider teaching as my second job. My first job is being an artist and it's not a nine to five working hours. It's 24 seven. You leave it, you breathe it, you wake up with it. You see your, the entire world through that lens, basically. I'm really happy with what's going on in mm. here though, but are, are you like thinking of like reducing the... I'm making a few contract? adjustments. Hoda so has spent like almost a year lights. working on her latest project. I'm a little bit worried about that because the light source feels a little bit... Her images of asylum seeker Beirouz Bouchani so, and other refugees yeah, on Manus great. Island are part of exhibitions at major galleries in Sydney and Melbourne. For the refugees living in the Manus Island Detention Centre, uncertainty about their future remains. It was at the end of October 2017 that the Australian government closed the detention centres on Manus Island. And that's when I remember um, seeing Behrouz on TV. Today they beat some of the refugees, so that was not uh, peaceful. I was watching Behrouz struggling on the news to communicate that with people over here. I saw something familiar in his eyes. My father was a Kurdish man too, and his family had to flee their home and move to another part of the country to be safe. Kurdish people are famous for their resistance uh, historically and their resistance has always been absolutely glorious. They never give up. So I had that sense of connection to him as well. In 2012, Hoda's father died. I all of a sudden felt like, like I lost my connection to Iran and my identity and my history. It was the most difficult experience I've ever faced with in life. So I decided to go back to Iran and travel and search for him in the country and maybe somehow come into terms with his loss through photography. Hoda travelled all over Iran with her camera. I started realising that unconsciously I'm photographing a lot of men. And I think it became part of that whole idea of searching for my father and that history. And there's one thing that if you look at all the portraits, it's that sense of fragility that is in the portrait of Ali. You see it as a young boy to the man that is sitting, the old man that is sitting on another rocky mountain staring into a distance. Portrait of Ali won the 2015 National Photographic Portrait Prize. I think again, it's like something that is what I know of my father and also another way of opposing that image of Middle Eastern men as all like dangerous, threatening extremist terrorists, you know. Potter's practice is very purposeful. Everything has a story. It's not art for art's sake. It's not just about the aesthetic. It's really important for her to be providing some kind of insight into somebody else's truth. The bathhouse was a secret space. I got invited uh, by a group of young homosexual men that I got to know through my travels. It's the only public space that they can be themselves openly and explore their sexualities. That was really fascinating to me where this private and public come together, the invisible and visible come together. And they wanted to share the intimacy that they had between them and also something that they were not allowed to share with anyone. It seemed impossible to me to get access to that space. But somehow, magically, it happened. They told us that, okay, you guys go in there, rent out the place, and you do whatever you want to do for, for a few hours. 
It's a collaboration between me and the subject matter. So they take control through performance. We are performing real stories with real people, real bodies in a real space. The beautiful intimacy that exists with, between like those bodies and the nakedness of it is what I tried to use in the next work that I made with Fahriz Buchani. When I contacted him, he said, finally an artist. I've been waiting for an artist to come to Manus. Working with Hoda uh, was very special for me because she wanted to come uh, immediately and I told her that no, it's better that we should do research together and work on this to understand uh, the soul of this prison camp. It took four months to work out how they would collaborate. It was in March 2018 that I decided to go to Manus Island. I went straight to Port Moresby and applied for a visa on arrival and I had to lie, I applied for a tourist visa because I knew if I applied for uh, other visas as a photographer, my application would get rejected. The landscape of Manus is extraordinarily beautiful, but what's quite fascinating and disturbing is the juxtaposition of the beauty of the island, the natural landscape and the extreme pain and suffering of these men. They hate the colour green, they call it green hell. <laughs> The ocean is so beautiful, they can't stand the beauty of the ocean. It hurts. A number of refugees got involved in the making of a video and a series of portraits. Each one of them told me a story and I explained to them how we can translate these narratives into sort of like visual metaphors that can express your emotions and feelings. For example, referring to natural elements was a way of sort of bringing out their humanity in the photographs. So each one of them, for example, picked something from the island. It was either sand, water, animals. Water was, for a lot of them, the symbol of the journey. And in between them and their homeland sits only water. For this guy, he he's a stateless Kurdish man and he picked sand because he said um, the sand is the land that is torn from me and I'm torn from it too. The last portrait that I made was the portrait of Behrouz Bouchani and we almost forgot to take his portrait. It was the plan to leave him for the last and on the last day before we leave I was like, Behrouz, what about you? So for Behrouz it was fire, the fire that he has, the passionate writer. Hoda's portrait of Buchani was one of over 3,000 entries for the 2018 Bowness Photography Prize. I printed the image large actually because I wanted you to feel like you were standing in front of him. We the judges were unanimous in our decision of the winner of the Bowness Photography Prize. We were all captivated by how compelling and powerful the work is. We've awarded the $30,000 acquisitive 2018 bonus photography prize to Hoda Ashfar. This is not just about Australia. This is about a new world that we are seeing, seeing come into being before our eyes. A world in which the defense of borders depends on the drawing of new lines between the included and the excluded, between citizens and bare lives. But these are very dangerous times, for what is being redrawn here are the limits of our human community. 
And the very fragility of those shifting lines means that one day, any one of us might find ourselves on the outside. I dedicate this prize to all the men, women, and children on Manus and Nauru. Thank you. I am Hoda Afsha. I believe in the power of images to change the world by changing the way that we see it. Next time on Compass. Time means nothing to me. You know, I start the day slow. I've had to learn how to do makeup differently and, and all little things that other people would never think about that you have to learn again. People look at me when I say oh, I've had a stroke. I go, oh, but you look great. This stroke business can't be too bad. <laughs> I'm All the people performing this play have had a stroke. They're not professional actors. We're all in the same boat. So we don't mind if someone makes a mistake because we just keep going. It doesn't matter to us. I believe in angels. Stroke Stories, next time on Compass. I have lost the stream. I have a dream.